Uh, good morning, everybody. We're here on the matter of Deutsche Bank Trust versus Harry Beauvais. Uh, it's 20 minutes aside. And uh, Council, let me know if you want to reserve some time. And I'll be happy to, to grant it to you. Let me know before we start. Also, before we start, on behalf of the court, I would like to thank uh, both sides for their supplemental briefs and also all the amicable briefs that we received. They were, everything was extremely helpful and we, we appreciate it very much. Council? <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. And if I might, I'd like to reserve five minutes, please, sure. for rebuttal. May it please the Court, my name is David Fine. I represent Deutsche Bank, the appellant in this matter. I'm joined by my co-counsel, William McCann. The Circuit Court erred, and this Court should reverse. The Association's argument and the Circuit Court's decision rests on a faulty premise, and that is that the attempted acceleration in 2007 somehow stopped the forward march of the installment obligation that Mr. Beauvais had. Indeed, it did not. Let us begin with Singleton against Kramar Associates. Singleton has been described by my opponents as a race judicata case. That is respectfully- Council, is the question whether the periodic payments continue to march on? March on? What, do, what does the mortgage say with regard to that? The mortgage does not say whether they do or they do not. It says that Mr. Beauvais owes installment payments on an ongoing basis. It says that the lender has the right to accelerate. It also says that the lender's decision to take any action uh, and to forbear on any action should not be considered a waiver. And so our position would be that unless and until there's a final judgment that the acceleration has been reduced to a final judgment such that it merges into a judgment, the ongoing obligation to pay installments continues, and indeed continues on until this day. And we think that Singleton supports that proposition. Just a, one factual thing. Would you agree the, the attempted acceleration occurred with the filing of the complaint? Your Honor, I know that this Court's decision this year in Snow. But I'm asking for your client's position. For purposes of this argument, we'll agree that Snow is correct, that it began with the filing of the complaint. Thank you. Now, counsel, on, on that issue, would you agree that in 2007, by filing the initial complaint, the bank moved the maturity date of the note to the date of the acceleration? No, Your Honor. Now, we have a case called Casino. And in, in that case, which cites a Supreme Court case, we say, when a lender elects to accelerate payment on a note, the lender accelerates the maturity date of the note itself. And that cites a 1937 Florida Supreme Court case. And there is essentially an unbroken line of cases that say that. Are you suggesting that that line of cases is not correct and should be revisited by our court? Your Honor, what I'm suggesting is that under 95-281, which is that statute of repose that deals with the maturity date of the mortgage. the mortgage, right? that because the acceleration mm -hmm. is not of record, which is what triggers the five-year statute of repose in 95-281, that, yes, the acceleration attempt does not affect the ultimate date of maturity so, of the mortgage. So the line of cases that uses the term the uh, lender elects to accelerate, that line of cases should be aggregate, abrogated. Your Honor, I, I'm not sure that I would agree with you that that's what that line of cases says. What I would say is that to the extent that that line of cases suggests something other than the interpretation of Section 95281 that I've suggested, then I think it's incorrect. Does, does, does after the bank exercises acceleration, or as you would say, begins the acceleration process by either filing the uh, lawsuit or sending notice, does the bank refuse to accept payments from the borrower for less than the accelerated amount in, 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 a, in a typical uh, case? Your Honor, I think it's, it, there is not a typical case, so I don't know what the answer is. And in this case, you would agree that there is no record evidence that the bank accepted or was, did, the, did the borrower try to pay uh, anything less than the accelerated amount um, during that process. I agree with that, Your Honor. That's the correct but statement counsel, of the record. Does not, does not the borrower have the option under the mortgage of bringing the mortgage current 
prior to the time the property is sold? Isn't that right accorded to the borrower in the mortgage itself? Your Honor, with one small correction, I think you're, you're absolutely correct. The mortgage allows reinstatement by the borrower at any time up until there's a judgment, and that reinstatement can be given effect by the borrower simply paying what is past due. Not by uh, uh, it doesn't require the borrower to pay the accelerated amount. That's correct, Your Honor. And so any time up until there's that judgment, there is that opportunity for the borrower to essentially call off the process, stop the wheels in motion. When the borrower makes that payment uh, or payments, does the borrower just make payments of the defaulted amounts, or to stop the process, must the borrower be current with all of the payments? So, for example, if the, if the complaint was filed based upon two missed payments, and then by the time that we get towards the end of the lawsuit, the borrower has only paid those two missed payments, would that stop the foreclosure process, or must the borrower also make all the subsequent payments to stop the process? Your Honor, my understanding is that at the time the borrower takes action, the borrower must bring the account current. But that doesn't mean pay the accelerated balance due. No. Just all payments that would be due up until that date, plus any of the other fees and costs associated with reinstatement. I believe that's correct, Your Honor. Not the accelerator amount, uh, Judge Wells, just the, the amount uh, that is past due. So although the bank has, has declared a default and filed an action saying I will, I've ex- we're going to accelerate, we seek to accelerate the entire balance due, the borrower still may bring out everything current by paying all the past due payments or whatever penalties and interest are due and owing at that time and is not obligated to pay the accelerated balance in order to reinstate the loan. That is correct, Your Honor. But doesn't that beg the question as to how long the borrower has those options when there's a statute of limitations provision in the Florida statutes? Your Honor, that would... Has it up until he or she or it has it up until the time that the statute runs, then there can't be a judgment anymore, right? Well, there isn't a judgment in the first place, Your Honor, and under that scenario, as I understand you to have posed it. Well, there'd be a judgment, I guess, on the statute of limitations. There wouldn't be a judgment on the merits. Well, I think, I think our position would be that if you commence a lawsuit and under Snow thereby, thereby uh, begin the process of acceleration, unless you end that process with a judgment of acceleration, you have not gotten to that point. Well, that, so state, there is no acceleration. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Has any other state spoken of a process of acceleration as opposed to acceleration accelerating the maturity of the debt? Well, Your Honor, I, th- I think I would <clears throat> try to clarify in this way. Number one, I don't know of any court that has used the language that I've used before this court. I think other courts have probably used similar language. But again, it's not the maturity of the debt, because that's a separate issue. That's, that's the issue that I was discussing with Judge Scales. That's 95281, that statute of repose, that takes this debt out to about 2041. What we're talking about here is 95112C, which is the statute of limitations for foreclosure. And that's, that's rather a different subject. But, but counsel, the statute of limitations <clears throat> for a promissory note is five years from the maturity date, correct? You would agree with that? That's my understanding, So yes, if the maturity date is accelerated by the bank via a lawsuit, via notice, or whatever, doesn't that then start the five-year five clock from when that maturity date is under virtually every case? No, Your Honor, because, again, the statute, 95281, speaks of a maturity date that is, that is calculated from what is determinable of record. Right. And, and, and that's for mortgages and for title purposes. Again, I'm focusing on the promissory note in this case. I believe, you know, we, the, the Bouvet opinion, as you know, has got two parts of it. That's right. One part says the note, the statute of limitations has run on the note. The other part talks in terms of the, the validity of the lien and how long the mortgage lien begins. I, I, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I was, I, was, I was going to differ a little bit with the characterization, but I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, I, I, go, go ahead. And, and I was going to say, I don't think that the first part of the panel decision talked about the statute of limitations for the note. I think it dealt with the statute of limitations for bringing a foreclosure action with respect to the mortgage. 
because the mortgage provides the remedy for failure to make the installment payments on the note. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And, and of course, that the mortgage does no more than secure payment for the note. It's not a separate, independent, standalone uh, instrument, is it? No, I agree with you. It, 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 it's in, so it's the sort of partnered, limit, if you will, so with the note. If the statute of limitations has run on collection of the note, then for all practical purposes, the foreclosure of the note based on a breach related, or the foreclosure of the mortgage based on a breach of the note is, is, is eliminated, right? It's, it, it, there's, there's no point in bringing that. No, Your Honor, because the, the mortgage is a separate entitlement of the mortgage holder, the mortgagee. But right. they, and, and there are separate obligations that may arise, like the, the obligation to pay taxes or the obligations of insurance. That's right. But the note obligations, if the statute of limitations has run on collection of the note, then the statute of limitations has run on foreclosure of the mortgage if the only alleged breach is failure to pay the note, correct? Your Honor, in that scenario and in that hypothetical, the answer is yes. I don't think that that hypothetical would actually occur. Isn't in that what New York law has held, that the acceleration brings the maturity current, and if the statute of limitations bars the note, it bars the enforcement of the mortgage. I believe that's correct, and I believe that, of course, New York, New York is not operating against the statutes that this court operates under, because we have 95281, we have 9511C2, and what they tell you're arguing different in, things. In effect, is that 95281 trumps the statute of limitations 9511 applicable to the note? Your Honor, I, I, I would not say that. What I would say is that they're two very different things. 95211, or pardon me, 9511C2 is a statute of limitations for a remedy, as, as Judge Wells mentioned, the remedy being the ability to foreclose on the mortgage. 95281 is a statute of repose with respect to the mortgage and its maturity date. Those are different things. You could lose, for example, hypothetically, the opportunity to foreclose as a remedy but nonetheless have the opportunity, nonetheless, to collect on what remains due under the mortgage at the end of the term, at the maturity date. Different remedies. And so, so I don't think one trumps the other. They just work together rather differently. So I could lose my ability to enforce the note and yet retain the ability to enforce the indebtedness evidenced by the note through foreclosure. No, Your Honor. That's, that's, that's not what I've said. Just the opposite. Yeah. You, you might stack. lose your remedy of obligation to foreclose at this time, but the promissory note still remains valid until its term ends or five years thereafter under the statute of repose. I think what Judge Wells says is, is absolutely correct. Okay. Counsel, let me, let, me, let me go back because I'm having a, a difficult time with the concept of acceleration and how the, when a note is accelerated, how there are still installment payments due after that acceleration. Is, is it the bank's argument in this case that the, the, the trial court's order of dismissal without prejudice of the 2007 case reinstated the installment nature of the note by operation of law? Your Honor, yes. That is, that is one way of viewing it. There are a couple of ways of viewing it that get you to the same place. Either the installment obligation was never affected because the acceleration was never reduced to judgment, and so the obligation to make installments remains a continuing obligation, something Singleton tells us. Or we can say that if Snow, the decision of this court, tells us that acceleration was commenced by the filing of the complaint, then the dismissal of that same complaint stops that process. They form bookends. Either way, once you get past that dismissal, the installment obligation continues to exist and goes forward. And again, that's what Singleton tells us. Well, doesn't Singleton specifically reference an adjudication that, quote, denies acceleration and foreclosure, end quote, as placing the parties back into their pre-lawsuit position? Your Honor, I would disagree with the characterization because I think what Singleton does is it offers <clears throat> some examples. It doesn't suggest that those examples are in any way limiting. 
it offered those examples presumably because the question of acceleration and the effect of acceleration in Singleton arose in a res judicata setting. And so in that setting, it mattered whether the judgment was, well, whether the dismissal was with or without prejudice. It would matter for res judicata. It wouldn't matter otherwise. That's why the court in Singleton would have offered those examples. Well, in, Sing and in Singleton, the court specifically referred to and quoted from, from Olympia Mortgage Corporation, which said, we disagree that the election to accelerate placed future installments at issue. That would seem to uh, suggest that the court was saying that the, the uh, installments were ongoing and had to continue to be pay paid as an obligation, even though a foreclosure action was filed seeking a remedy of acceleration. Your Honor, I, b I believe that that's entirely a correct reading of Singleton. And that's why the description that you've given is why I've suggested here that it's best to read Singleton not as a res judicata case or a statute of limitations case, but as an acceleration case in the mortgage context, because that's what the Supreme Court was telling us. It didn't discuss the intricacies of res judicata. What it did was it told us what was the effect of that attempted acceleration on future installments. Well, Singleton really was addressing the issue of if you dismiss a case with prejudice, what effect that would have on being able to file a uh, subsequent foreclosure action and being able to collect on the uh, defaulted payments that you sued under the, under the first action. Correct. But uh, Singleton court does went not further say, in discussing uh, acceleration. That's right. But as, as we've stated in our briefs, and, and I'll reiterate here, the subsidiary holding of Singleton is, is controlling here because it tells us in the section that Your Honor read from Singleton quoting Olympia Mortgage that it does not affect the ongoing obligation to make installment payments. And that's true. And of course, the court didn't say anything about whether it was with or without prejudice. In I'm that sorry, regard, Judge, counsel, in that regard, if I could, if you could help me with just a little factual background. It, um, normally with these mortgages, is the, does the bank have a contractual obligation to issue monthly invoices? I believe typically they send some sort of a coupon book. And so when the case was dismissed, if the parties were returned to their uh, original position, then the bank would have been contractually obligated to send out uh, monthly invoices. Well, because no, the if, they sent out coupons, if they had sent out coupons at the beginning of the relationship, then no, they wouldn't be sending monthly invoices. Oh, so they, I, I misunderstood your first answer then. So, so usually these are done by coupons and there isn't a monthly uh, invoice. Do, do, I thought banks sent out monthly invoices on mortgages. Not, well, Your Honor, I'll be honest, I don't know in the record of this particular case, Mr. Beauvais' case, whether it was coupons or monthly invoices. I can only tell you that in my own circumstance, which I realize is not of record, <laughs> we got coupons, we don't get a monthly invoice, and so it's then our responsibility to go forward. And of course, if that first foreclosure action is dismissed, those coupons are still there, and, and course, the borrower people, still knows. Thank many you. people pay their mortgages by automatic deduction from their banking account. They never see anything. The money just disappears every month, if there's money there. I, I think that's right. Your Honor, Judge Scales, did you have a question that you wanted to pose? Yeah, with, with regard to Singleton, there's nothing in Singleton that stands for the proposition that uh, uh, acceleration is a process which is only final upon an adjudication, is there? No. Okay, so that, that's, that's simply the bank's argument in this case, that the acceleration is merely a process and it is not um, uh, perfected, if you will, upon an adjudication of acceleration. Well, it is perfected, would be the, would be the argument. But let me address your, your question. In other words, if there was a judgment on a, a judgment, then the balance is accelerated and that's the end of it. That's right. The, the installment obligation then merges into the judgment, which is for the full amount. So if I may, because you've, you've chosen this phrase, I think, very carefully and thoughtfully, attempted acceleration. And I'm going to presume that this is your best argument because you made it your first argument knowing you'd be in front of ten inquisitive judges and might not get to your second argument. So how do you reconcile this concept of attempted acceleration with a scenario slightly different in which the acceleration is not merely pled in the complaint but is by way of a letter uh, without a complaint? What happens to that acceleration? It, is it, does it not exist until a lawsuit is filed? 
or does the statute of limitations begin to run at the time that that uh, letter of acceleration is received by the borrower? No, Your Honor. The statute of limitations certainly does not begin to run from the time of the notice. Under this Court's authority in Snow, which for purposes of this discussion we'll accept as, as stating the law, it certainly is in this district, the statute of limitations begins to run from the filing of the complaint. That notice is simply a notice of intent. What if the letter doesn't say merely we intend, but rather we are in fact accelerating? It doesn't but, do but it. They don't file it in a complaint. It does not, it does not start the, the running of the clock, Your Honor. Snow says that the running of the clock begins with the filing of the complaint. Of you mean it begins, I'm sorry, Snow says that it begins with the filing of the complaint regardless of the existence or non-existence of a prior acceleration letter, or in the absence of same, the allegation of acceleration uh, in the complaint begins the running of the statute. Your Honor, I don't think Snow actually made the distinction between them. Snow was, was there the, a pre-suit acceleration letter in Snow? Your Honor, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the, the record of that case. Um, I see, Your Honor, that I'm into my rebuttal We've time. We've taken you over your rebuttal time, but you'll still have some rebuttal time, Counsel. Thank you, Thank Your you Honor. very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. May it please the Court. My name is Todd Wallen. I'm here on behalf of the Appellee Aquamaster Association, and with me today is my co-counsel, Stephen Siegfried. Good morning. Do you agree the acceleration occurred when the complaint was filed? Absolutely. This Court has held over and over again every state in the country that, is, that has examined the issue as to when uh, an acceleration uh, is effective and starts a statute of limitations to run is, is, is when a written demand is made. So if acceleration occurred at the moment that action was filed, then the provision in the mortgage that says that the borrower could reinstate the mortgage was simply a nullity at that point, unless he paid the entire for, outstanding accelerated For purposes balance. of the statute of limitations, and, and, and this is important, statute of limitations analyses require two inquiries. When did the cause of action accrue? And was the action filed within the limitations period uh, set forth in, in, in the well, relevant statute? you can't have it both ways. If the filing of the action accelerated with an absolute acceleration of the entire balance due, as you say, then what ha then the right to reinstate in the mortgage the contract between the borrower and the and the lender mm -hmm. um, would then have to be uh, it would be contrary to that provision which allows the borrower to reinstate simply by bringing current the outstanding and the defaulted payments sure not? sure the borrower has has the the right to reinstate after acceleration the mortgage itself describes acceleration as a precondition reinstatement doesn't make any sense unless the loan is accelerated well it also describes it as a remedy correct acceleration describes. is a remedy right well, specifically that's true what it's, true it's, but 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 again i want to get back to fundamentals here well but but i think that is fundamental because it seems to me that what you're arguing is that acceleration is a element of the cause of action because you're saying when it accrues where it appears that from the mortgage and the note it's a remedy particularly acceleration. At, the, at the language in paragraph 19 of the mortgage it, it seems to me that unless you read that paragraph as, as um, deeming acceleration to be a process rather than an element of the of, of the case you know, you're making an you're saying that paragraph 19 just doesn't apply at all i'm not, I'm not saying that at all I'm, I'm not saying that at all. Acceleration is an election. Reinstatement is something that happens after the election. The law of this, of this state, the law of this court, look at Campbell versus Warner, look at uh, Judge Lagoa's opinion in, in, in Cato Company versus Rhodes, look at this court's opinion in Snow versus Wells Fargo. The, the cause of action accrues, that's the critical point, when the demand is made. Can I, can I ask you a question regarding um, the uh, acceleration? The second complaint was based on a different default, correct? They, they alleged a, a month later, but, but it is default date prior to the date of acceleration, yes. But how do you then address all the line of cases from um, Bartram on and all the federal cases that deal with the fact that uh, a subsequent default 
does not bar a separate and distinct cause of action. Okay. I, I'd like to address that because because it, it, Judge Scales pointed out that there are many decisions that, that hold that the, the the act of acceleration brings the maturity date uh, uh, forward. Uh, Judge Lagoa, your, your own opinion in Rhodes uh, holds that. Um, the confusion has arisen. It started with Olympia. I want to, start, I want to talk about Olympia and, and Singleton. It, it started with Olympia. Olympia has one sentence. Uh, it's, a, it's a two dismissal case. The first, the first foreclosure action was accelerated, but then the court specifically notes that the lender had no standing and no right to accelerate the debt. Under those circumstances, of course the acceleration can't bring all future defaults into, into question. In the second foreclosure action, the, the same thing occurred. There was a pre-suit notice for the acceleration that was required. They didn't comply with it. That, too, did not bring future defaults into question. So, yes, there could be future defaults under, under, under Olympia. And that sentence, when read in the context of that case, makes sense. It is not but a broad sweeping. if we're talking about standing, if we're talking about a, a case involving you couldn't accelerate because you didn't have standing to bring the lawsuit, under your theory, just the fact of filing the lawsuit ex accelerated, that, that's a matter of defense and proof to the end to see if you're entitled to the, as Judge Rothenberg suggested, accelerate to, to the remedy of accelerating and getting the whole loan. Well, once you accelerate, the cause of action accrues. If, if, if that case is dismissed, and, and, and for instance, in, in a case like this where we plead these statute of limitations as an affirmative defense, the mortgagee could potentially avoid it under certain situations, such as in, in the Rhodes opinion. Uh, what happened there is the mortgagee said, yes, you've got a facially valid statute of limitations uh, defense, but we're pleading an avoidance waiver. You, you, you waived your right to it. The, the, the lender could also plead an avoidance that the loan, yes, we, we accelerated the debt properly back in 2007, but we reinstated the loan sub uh, subsequently. Um, the lender could plead that, yes, we accelerated or we demanded full payment back in 2007, but we didn't, in fact, have a right to it. It turned out we didn't have the note and mortgage yet. One of the problems is, <coughs> and, I, and we're going back to the definition of acceleration is an acceleration of process, whatever. So the, the bank gives notice of acceleration. Let's assume that all the preconditions are met. Mm -hmm. Let's assume, you know, there's no waiver, et cetera. Um, but if acceleration means that the final amount, the total amount is due, then it's really not due because of that paragraph 19. In other words, uh, uh, I mean, legally, it's, you know, the, it's not due because the borrower can step in and say, I'm going to make a partial payment and put this thing back on installments. But, but what it means is that the lender has the right to declare the full amount due and to proceed with a foreclosure action. And that's why a okay, is acce so critical. Acceleration means what? It means we've elected to proceed with a foreclosure action. We're demanding full payment. Yes, afterwards, well, what if the acceleration is defective, though? I mean, what, in other words, what well, if they, if they, if they, they say they we can, elect they acceleration? It. We elect acceleration. We're in, uh, going forward to try to collect the whole amount. The fact that they say that doesn't mean it's happened. In other no. words, maybe they didn't meet the preconditions. Maybe some, you know, maybe the the, sure. the borrower sure. steps in, and, and those and, would be wonderful. Wonderful uh, uh, avoidances to plead to the statute of limitations defense in the forthcoming lawsuit. Absolutely, could do that. Or you, you can could say, pay, I didn't have or you can, or you can remedy it by paying your past, past due amounts anytime within the five years. Yeah, you could, but but there's no evidence of that occurring here. Okay, but but, 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 the, but, the but you're saying you're defining acceleration as <laughs> really as an attempt to accelerate. Acceleration well, means when, when you attempt to accelerate, what, whether you successfully do it or not. Whereas uh, another definition would be acceleration means the actual full amount of the money is due. Acceleration means you've got a right to make the claim on the entire debt. That's what triggers the statute of limitations. You're, you've got the right to make the claim. But that's the difficulty I'm having with this. Is <clears throat> if you file a lawsuit that is seeking foreclosure, you're seeking foreclosure, mm -hmm. and you're asking as a remedy in this case for the full balance of the, of the note. If that lawsuit is dismissed, then why is not all of the uh, things that you've requested in the lawsuit also dismissed? That's, that's an excellent question. And the question. remedy that you've sought no longer exists because there is no foreclosure. And that, that brings me to the Singleton case that I meant to discuss a moment ago but got sidetracked. Singleton is, is a res judicata case. It's very important to, to recognize the context. In that case, the, 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 the lender... Let's, let's just forget Singleton and, and let's not okay. even talk about whether it's applicable to this if, scenario or not. Okay. Explain to me how if you're seeking a particular remedy through foreclosure, 
and the foreclosure action is dismissed, why that remedy does not also get dismissed with the action and conceivably, that was dismissed. Conceivably, if there was a dismissal with prejudice, a avoidance could be pled against uh, to, to the statute of limitations defense. Why does with prejudice matter? Because, it, it, because seem, it would seem to me that the only um, applicability of the with prejudice finding is as to raise judicata, no. not as to whether or not uh, the claim or the prayer for relief still exists. I, I, I disagree, Your Honor. I, I think what the effect of a dismissal with prejudice would be, and the argument would be, and, I, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but, but the argument would be that the dismissal with prejudice adjudicated the, the claim that the borrower is in default. And as of the date of that adjudication, there could have been no, there is no default up to the date of that adjudication, and therefore, back in 2007, there would have been no right to accelerate because there was no default. Except it, that as we sit here, all of us who have practiced in the court of law or mm -hmm. presided over cases know that not all uh, dismissals with prejudice actually adjudicate anything. I, I agree. It's a fiction. dismissals with prejudice that don't adjudicate the issues of the case. I agree. And that is my problem with the distinction between dismissal with or without prejudice with respect to the ability to, uh, I'll call it, deceleration of the note. I, I really believe it, that term exists. I, I agree 100 percent, Judge Fernandez. And that's an issue for another day. So, counsel, the, shouldn't, shouldn't he? So. <laughs> shouldn't no. he? It's squarely before us now as well. I, I, there's no dismissal with prejudice in this case. No, you can issue an advisory the opinion, I suppose. The opinion is, is important here. Well, no, no. The, 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 the point is, I can foresee, I can, I can see the argument being made that the dismissal with prejudice rules that the borrower never defaulted. And if in 2010 there's an adjudication of the borrower never defaulted up until 2010, then by definition the acceleration in 2007 wasn't valid. And, and sure, there, there will be continuing rights from 2007 forward. Um, if it's not an adjudication that the borrower didn't actually default, or didn't actually yeah, default on the loan, then the effect has not, it has no effect on it. Because the accrual of the cause of action but is, do, is from the a, written demand. How does a remedy exist after the, the cause of action is dismissed? <clears throat> the remedy that you sought, which is acceleration, how does that continue to exist after the cause of action is dismissed? That's the difficulty I'm because, having. Because because the, the question of accrual doesn't care that the, that the demand was made in a complaint. The question of accrual is when the written, 95.031, when is the written demand made? And when the written demand is made in a complaint, it's just like a letter. It doesn't make a difference. A dismissal without prejudice doesn't undo the fact that the borrower but or that the it lender has a the right. Demand? It dismisses the demand. It dismisses it, the entire lawsuit. It, it doesn't dismiss the entire the demand. It, it, it doesn't undo the fact that the, the lender had the right to well, demand the full payment missed, and that they, you've they exercised the September it. September payment. In this case, you've missed the September payment. And we may. We may ex we may the letter said we have the right to exercise our you know to seek to seek uh, to, uh, a foreclosure and to accelerate the loan. That's what the letter says in this case. But it never that never came to fruition. It it didn't happen for whatever reason. It didn't it didn't uh, it never has been entitled to the entire amount. There's a, there's a dismissal with prejudice is like it's over. A dismissal with prejudice. Oh, a dismissal without prejudice. It's, it's over. This right, but over. it doesn't undo the fact that the, the borrower defaulted, the lender had the right to make the demand, and the lender did issue a written demand. Yeah, so Just because it's in a complaint that they didn't they didn't follow through with doesn't make any difference. So you're saying the no. demand accelerates the accelerates Correct. the It's the, the demand. Out. It's the Absolutely. demand. The fact that it's in the form of a of a, of a complaint makes no difference. Ninety five point zero three one makes that clear. It's so would you would you address not your your opposing counsel? Uh, place considerable reliance upon 95.281 95 and, and the lien and 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 suggest if I understood what he was saying that because of that the existence of uh, the lien uh, not being not being uh, being in existence potentially for five to twenty years that somehow that also extends out the mortgage, the foreclosure point. Frankly, Your can Honor, you, I, can you address that? For I, me? I, I don't understand the argument. It doesn't make any sense to me. I, I think that 95.281 <clears throat> is sets an it's a limitation statute. It's it sets the outer bounds for for, for the so life what of the lien. What does one do with the lien then? Well, I it doesn't. The the lien is ancillary 
to the debt. If the debt is no longer enforceable, it makes no sense for the lien to continue to exist. All right. The, the difficulty is we, we can we, 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 we probably should not rule just based on common sense when we have when we have a statute that keeps it going for five agree, or twenty the years. Would that would there be a potential would there be a potential for a quiet title action where equity might come into play with respect to ninety five point two eighty one and foreclose and uh, quiet title in in the borrower? You mean after the statute's run, can the borrower quiet title? Let's assume that, that the, the note, the statute of limitations is passed on the note, that because the mortgage <coughs> not only follows the note, but, it, but exists to requite the, uh, the loan, requite the loan, what the bank did, um, and that that's over, but that we have the lien still hanging out there. And we we have all these issues about alienation and and transfer and all those things. Can that even despite the statute, can a court of equity, in a in a um, quiet title action, come back around and extinguish the lien? I, I think that they should. Under the the panel's opinion, in in, in, in this case, they can't. Um, but, but you we have to said, remember that we said the quiet did was there was there no there, there was, was no, no quiet, quiet title there was no here, quiet but, title point in, our, in this case we talked about it but right, there really but, wasn't a quiet title right action. but the issue is whether the lien should be extinguished along with the, I mean, we with, could with say the, the, the right. we could say for example that the lien is there subject to whatever some court might do in a quiet title action I suppose right sure sure you can say that it's subject to but 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 it, it you know the, the fact remains that the, the principle is the same you know can, can the, the lien statute exist? says what the statute says and we interpret statutes of limitation right. or but, but, like, but in, like any other law even if the, if the concern is that that the maturity date is not of record in a case like this it is of record when when, when a lender um, accelerates the debt and, and demands payment in full and files a foreclosure action they file Liz pendants Liz pendants becomes of record it puts the world on notice that the acceleration the, accel the maturity date has been accelerated and so if you want to read the uh, statute Liz in that way that all a Liz pendants does is say we are that there's something going on with the property. Right, and but you want to notice that you need to look at what's going on. It, yeah. The, the, the fact of the matter is, though, It, it that seems like it's your position that the lender must do something affirmatively to deaccelerate, correct? If, if the contract had provided that, first of all, deacceleration so is nothing other than reinstatement. So then, then your position is not that. Your position is that it can never be a deaccelerator? I, it can be. It can be reinstated by the lender if the contract provides for that. Well, this contract your, doesn't. What is your position in this case? You're saying in this case, once the bank accelerated the note, even if the 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 there's even if there's if the borrower makes all the payments do and reinstates the note, that acceleration still exists. Absolutely not. If it's well, if it's reinstated, it's reinstated, then there's new 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 well, obligations so and new saying, opportunities for default. You're saying under that scenario, it automatically gets reinstated. Correct. Okay. Council so if, but, if but it, there's no other condition in which there is a reinstatement. That was your your you earlier stated, I think that Correct. It's never. So the only way. Well, no, to no. There, there's other ways it could be reinstated. There, there could be a, a, a reinstated effectively by waiver. If, the, if, for instance, if after acceleration the borrower started making payments again and the lender started accepting them, uh, there are there is authority for the fact that that, that would be an effective reinstatement. In fact, but, that's what happened. If you watch Justice that, Pariente, she said that's what happened in Singleton. Then your position is the lender can never deaccelerate after it accelerates unless there's a waiver or it's been reinstated by the borrower? Unless they put it in their contract, they don't have a right. It's not for the courts to rewrite no, the mortgage that, contract. There's nothing in this contract. That provides a right to a lender to reinstate the loan. No, under is, under Singleton, there's, a, there's an additional way, correct, to, to, to reinstate, and that is if there is an adjudication which denies acceleration and foreclosure, which puts the parties back into their pre-lawsuit position, like in the example that they give in Singleton, where the bank files a foreclosure complaint, the, the uh, borrower says, wait, I paid, I paid, you just, you just did it incorrectly. The borrower prevails in that lawsuit, 
there is an adjudication which denies the bank's acceleration and foreclosure, and the parties are placed back into the, their original position. You would agree that under, the, under that scenario, there is a judicial mechanism for reinstatement. Under that scenario, I would agree. And bear with me a moment. I, won't, I don't agree that Singleton says that, though. Singleton involved a second, there was an accelerated debt, there was a subsequent foreclosure action. It was a res judicata case. All the court was concerned with is was the first one dismissed on, on the merits and was the second the same. They decided the second was the same. They did not, this is absolutely critical, they did not explain how it was possible that there was a second, excel, or, or a second a default after the note was accelerated. It could have been reinstated. There could have been a waiver. And, and it could have been, as you suggest, because the, the, the judgment of dismissal was with prejudice put the parties, you know, uh, it, it, there was no effect of acceleration. It could have been. But, but the counsel, court didn't explain here's the it. problem with that entire line of reasoning. When you have a dismissal, with or without prejudice, the order doesn't say, we're dismissing this because blah, 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 or because it says dismissed, right. with or without prejudice. So that whole scenario is just speculation. It's like, well, here's what could have happened. But when you have a dismissal, it could have been for any reason at all, like you didn't show up at the case management. That, that's why I think it's important to go back to fundamentals. When did, the, if, 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 if the next foreclosure action, the statute of limitations is asserted as a defense, the lender has the obligation to plead an avoidance. I didn't, in fact, have the right to accelerate at that time and to, to file an action to foreclose. Regardless of what that dismissal order says, unless it's written in the dismissal order that, that I find that the borrower had not defaulted and therefore you know, the action is dismissed, if that's true, then, then, it's, then it's an easy well, decision. Well, not your theory that the minute you accelerate and file that lawsuit, it's accelerated and it's over. No, I didn't say that. I said that the, the, the cause of action has accrued and they've got a right to foreclose and they've got a right to carry it through to a judgment. Uh, but do you realize that your position is contrary to the position of every state except one? that a lender can't deaccelerate, affirmatively can't deaccelerate after acceleration's taken place. I think there's only one state that has made that finding and all well, the well, other states. Well, certainly Connecticut is, 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 is one state that, 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 that does that. But I, I think, think that I, 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 my, my position is, is from a plain reading of the, of the mortgage. The other and, 13 and I don't know states what the that have addressed this. Those the other, other 13 states, states that have addressed the same issue disagree with you, correct? I, I, I don't know. I think I don't know what the mortgage is saying in those in those in those situations. The the point is though that, that every state that's looked at the issue of well, the effect of a dismissal without prejudice, every single state has agreed it has no effect on the running of the statute. But of counsel, to address Judge Fernandez's concern, which I do think is a is a valid mm -hmm. concern about the mm -hmm. distinction between a dismissal with prejudice, without prejudice, a dismissal voluntarily or involuntarily, isn't a better rule and a rule that would. Uh, reconcile and harmonize Singleton is that the second court, in this case, the, 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 in the 2012 case, mm -hmm. look and actually make an inquiry regarding the circumstances of the first dismissal and determine whether or not the bank actually treated the dismissal as putting the parties back into the same position with their same rights and responsibilities as far as an automatic rule regarding the nature of the dismissal because I think we can all agree that the dismissal in this case didn't, didn't talk about acceleration, didn't talk about deceleration, didn't even use the word foreclosure. I think the obligation of the court would be if it was pled in avoidance, which it wasn't in this case, and there was no dispute below. This argument is made for the first time on appeal. There was no dispute below that the action was accelerated in 2007 that, the, that, 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 that started the, the statute of limitations. Well, fact, but if there had been pled, you're right. In fact, the bank's responses to your request for admission said, we don't know anything about a 2007 I agree, case. but when the summary judgment came around, they said, you're right. It starts with the, with the acceleration, and we accelerated in 2007. You're, you're right. They played games with their response to request for admissions and just said, I don't know what, what, what that, we don't know anything about the, the prior complaint. They were hoping that someone would default and therefore, because statute of limitations is an affirmative defense, then, uh, you know, it's uh, You're not saying your client didn't have, was making mortgage payments after the first default. My client acquired the property after well, because, you're, you're the, because the borrower but... defaulted on his obligations to us as well. Counsel, I'd like to ask a question. Um, I, hope, I hope Joe Shepard doesn't throw a book at my head when I ask this because it's a policy question. <laughs> But, uh, and I know we're not here to talk just policy, we're here to talk law, but, but what's the problem with a rule that says when the complaint is the vehicle 
to begin the process of accelerate or to accelerate whatever, however we define that. When the complaint is the vehicle to accelerate, that the dismissal of that complaint automatically deaccelerates or reinstates is, you know. Because it ignores the legislative mandate of 95.031, says that the demand starts is, is, is the accrual, regardless of where, how the form of the demand the, the, that starts the clock running. And the dismissal without prejudice doesn't have any effect on that. It's not, it's not one of the things that, that tolls the statute of limitations under 95.05. Unless, unless, like the Florida Supreme Court in, in Singleton, you view each individual default as an accrual of a new I, cause I of action. I disagree that the Florida Supreme Court did that. The Florida Supreme Court did not say why there was a subsequent default. It didn't say that there wasn't a, a, a reinstatement. And in fact, Justice Perriente admitted during arguments last week that there was, in fact, an effective reinstatement because the borrower made continuing payments after the acceleration, which were accepted. Except in the last paragraph of its per decision under its conclusion, and Singleton says, in this case, the subsequent and separate alleged default created a new and independent right in the mortgagee to accelerate payment on the note and in a subsequent foreclosure. And it did because it was reinstated. Council, my name has been invoked, so I think I get. Uh, <laughs> I, think I, I think I get uh, fair, I'm, I'm fair, fair, fair time here. It must the be fact, time to adjourn. Time's up. <laughs> yes, yeah, we're, we're about there. I agree with that. But anyway, this whole discussion of deceleration, whether you call it deceleration, nullification, um, you know, pulling things back, whatever it is, it's just a formalism. I mean, there's nothing out there. Nothing in, in nothing, there's no case law here. In fact, many states, many states, if, if you want to believe what Yale Law School has to say, uh, and I'm not so sure I do, but many states, many states, according to Yale Law School, says the vast majority of states with laws on the question reject automatic deceleration of the note on dismissal of foreclosure action. It's all a formalism is all it is. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a single state that, that, that holds that a dismissal with, without prejudice. Um, but there are a lot of federal, federal decisions in this state that and, have and, made and that finding and, and interpret Singleton to Correct, correct. and that's, that started that. with and Dorda. the problem that we have is lots of states are not a mortgage foreclosure state. They may be deed and trust states. Well, and well but, but that, that's true. But, but Connecticut and New York and, and a lot of those states are judicial foreclosure states. And the Nevada case that, that, that the panel cited, uh, the, the Cato Company case, yeah, it's not a judicial foreclosure state, but, but it can be done by a judicial process. And in fact, it was. And that's why there's a dismissal without prejudice. It doesn't make any sense that there would be a dismissal without prejudice if they invoked a non-judicial process. So that, 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 that case is absolutely applicable, but well, again, again, assuming have, that the mortgage allows it. You have excellent briefs here from the Florida Bar mm -hmm. and from the real estate section of the Florida Bar mm -hmm. and even from Fannie Mae that confirmed that the practice, the practice in this state always has been that there's no deceleration notification required. The practice is when the lawsuit's dismissed, it's over and you go on to the next workload? Sure, sure. The practice is to, to pretend it didn't happen and hope the borrower defaults and take the house, of course. Council, we've taken, I've given you an extra <laughs> five minutes because okay. we, took, we took council over. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you'll have the five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate the indulgence. <clears throat> May it please the court, I'd like to address a few things that came up while my opponent was at the lectern. And I think that an important point was raised, uh, we'll say, at this end of the <laughs> dais. I don't think we're divided that way, but go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't describing a distinction. I was describing only geography. I haven't asked one question, so you don't know which end of the dais I'm on. You are, you are Justice Kennedy. <laughs> you, are, you, are, you are the swing boat, Your Honor. What I was going to say is, let's set Singleton to one side, and let's look at the mortgage document. And I think that that's a point uh, that uh, Judge Rothenberg suggested. If you look at this mortgage document, as, as a couple of the judges have noted, it has the reinstatement provision, and what that says is that any time up until there's a judgment of foreclosure and acceleration, Mr. Beauvais or his successor can simply pay what's past due and avoid acceleration. That remains true even today. When I because read that paragraph, I think of the acceleration as a soft acceleration. There isn't anything hard and fast about it because you can always reinstate by bringing the account current. Yes. And there's nothing the bank can do about that. The bank can't say, wait a minute, we asked for 
the full amount due, and we're entitled to that because you're not under paragraph 19 of the mortgage. Your Honor, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think, by the way, that that analysis also answers a question that Judge Scales was asking Mr. Wallen, which is the distinction between with and without prejudice. The point is that unless there's a judgment, a favorable judgment of acceleration and default and foreclosure, then that reinstatement provision continues to exist. If, it doesn't if, matter what calls it off. If the, if the borrower sends in the past due amount uh, after five years from the declaration of acceleration, whether it be by letter or, or lawsuit, um, can the lender um, refuse to accept it? No. No, I don't think so, because the acceleration was never completed by judgment, and that means that at any time until there's that judgment, the, the borrower I'm, can maybe make Maybe I misstated my question. So your position is that any time up through year number 30, so long as or whatever it is, that even if, the, even if there's <coughs> been a declaration of acceleration in a letter, that the borrower can come in and and refresh if that's all there's been and there's been no judgment of foreclosure yes the answer is yes Isn't but it that what be paragraph? just any past due amount it's got to be what brings the mortgage current that's right what paragraph 19 a partial payment the bank could reject a partial payment correct as a matter of practice i don't know that the bank does but it could contractually but it specifically says all sums which would be due as if no acceleration had occurred so obviously it's not the full amount the that's acceleration right. amount, but it's the, all the sums that would be due up until the date of the payment. That's right. So if it were 15 years hence in the hypothetical that Judge Shepard offered, uh, Judge Fernandez, I think the answer would be yes, as long as the borrower came up to date. But the bottom on the back line is, payments. even 15 years later, the borrower does not have to pay the amount that was accelerated back in year one. He pays that's correct. only what's been accruing in the meantime until <coughs> reinstate the borrower. It's reinstate. And that's a contractual provision here. It is. And, and Your Honor, in the case of Mr. Beauvais or the association now, that continues to this day because there's never been a judgment. Counsel, I mean, a possible problem with this argument is paragraph 19 refers to the right to reinstate after acceleration. So again, we're getting back to this problem of what does acceleration mean? Because I, I don't think you can say, um, that the right to reinstate after acceleration means acceleration didn't, cause, didn't occur because the right to reinstate doesn't even accrue until after acceleration. You know what I mean? It's a little, I mean, at it least becomes circular. We have a, we have a contra the, the language of the contract suggests maybe an alternate understanding of acceleration. Well, I understand that the drafting is, is perhaps not as, as precise as one might want, but I don't think that it suggests anything other than what we've described here. Judge Fernandez referred to the potential for sort of a, a soft acceleration and then a hard acceleration. Let's consider it that way. When the complaint is filed under snow, there is a soft acceleration. If there is a judgment, then it becomes a hard acceleration because paragraph 19 no longer affords the borrower the opportunity. Well, isn't it really reason. better to think of it as acceleration is a prerequisite to filing a cause of action to collect or foreclose on an accelerated debt. And the judgment is, in fact, the collection of that accelerated debt or the foreclosure on that accelerated debt. But without the acceleration, the, bar, the lender does not have a right to seek a cause of action on an accelerated debt. True? Your Honor, I don't think I'd agree with the characterization. I think what I would say is Do that you believe that a lender would have a right to file a cause of action on an accelerated debt without first accelerating? Your Honor. Without first giving notice of intent to accelerate. Thank you. That's the language that I needed. No, because the mortgage says that you so have to give that notice. So here's the question. So you does must the give giving, notice. Does the giving of that notice of intent to accelerate begin the running of the statute of limitations? It does not. So then the statute of limitations does not begin to run, if I understand your argument, until the judgment. 
Well, that would ultimately be our position. I know that it's the So then that would mean there would be no such thing as a statute of limitations on an action to collect on an accelerated no, debt. If it begins to run at the time of the judgment, and the judgment is against the lender, then, of course, new defaults occur, and then this, a new statute will begin to run. If the judgment is in favor of the lender, then they don't — there can be no bar because you've now got a judgment on that accelerated debt, right? Well, Your Honor, I understand the problem that you're identifying. Is that, but we, is that true or you don't agree with that? I don't Once agree. you get the judgment, I, then I the statute I don't agree with that because there are other things that could occur that would make that judgment and the statute of limitations running forward nonetheless valuable and meaningful. But the Court need not go there because the Court has said in Snow that it's the filing of the complaint. And let's accept that for purposes of argument because if it's the filing of the complaint, the bookend of the filing of the complaint is the dismissal of the complaint. And the statute of limitations still applies as to that default. There's only five years that you can sue on that particular default. You, yes. So you can only you know, claw back five years. That's right, Your Honor. With respect to the statute of limitations for foreclosure, there is just that five-year retrospective window. Counsel, we, uh, I'm sorry. Counsel, we've taken you way over. Appreciate your time. Appreciate both sides. Interesting briefs. Thank you very much. Job well done. And John. thank you, Your Honors. All right.